start this workshop. Um, I wanted to welcome Annie once again um, back to the museum. I believe this is our third year together. Um, yeah. Quite wonderful. Um, Dr. Annie Storr is a resident scholar of Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis University. She teaches both art history and education, um, having devoted her career to exploring the intersection of these two disciplines. Today, she'll lead art experiencing exercises um, through the museum's uh, current exhibition, um, Enrico Riley. Um, she has developed exercises for the quiet eye, EQE, which encourages patient reflection, appreciation, and an attempt to avoid the rush to understand or determine a set interpretation of what we see. Her research areas are in interdisciplinary art history, social history, museum studies, histories of art education, um, audience studies, and learning assessments. Um, and I'm very pleased to have her again and to share her um, with you um, so that you can learn different ways to use um, you know, our current exhibitions and the museums. Um, if you're a student, um, this applies to students, um, faculty, um, staff, um, and pretty much any museum um, visitor. So Annie, um, welcome, and I'm just gonna hand it right over to you. Lovely, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be back, even though it's being back in a different kind of way. I think this is the 11th workshop, 10th or 11th workshop. So that's really wonderful. Um, what that has given Sarah and me, or UNH and EQE, a chance to do is to gradually, incrementally build looking skills. And each session is designed so that you can jump in for the first time. Or if you have done this before with me or something similar in another context, um, I'm going to keep the explanations to a minimum um, this time. And we're mostly going to do it. To some looking together. Um, and we're also going to do it in a way that tries to be, to, to re-encapture some of the experience of going to a gallery in person, which is only in a limited way possible at the moment, but also does some things that are independent that we couldn't have done without group Zoom. So um, uh, the first thing we'll do in looking at this exhibition, the current exhibition of work by Enrico Riley, who's a professor in New Hampshire, um, is to imagine that you were coming in, waiting for a program, and kind of wandering through the exhibition on your own. As one quick forenote, the whole purpose of this method of looking, there are lots of nuances and philosophies, but the basic one is to get all of us who tend to rush through everything in our lives, um, and particularly rush through looking at art, um, to slow down. And in walking you through the exhibition, I'm going to have to compromise that a little bit. We know that the average looking time of a museum visitor, um, looking at a work of art, is something like 17 seconds. Um, more about that, but 17 seconds is not enough time to take in the same sensory nature of the work, to let emotional responses occur, and to think it through. You can't do all three. So what we basically have created is a um, art-loving society who rushes. And I'm going to try to slow you down. That's mostly what we're doing today. That said, um, all we can do in walking through the exhibition without uh, using all of our time, is to give each work a little bit more than 17 seconds. So just a little bit more without comment, as if you were wandering, um, I'm going to just run, walk through the, the 12 works in the exhibition. Then we'll take a breath, a breath and go into doing three or four, depending on the time, structured activities for looking. So here we go, through the exhibition. You will notice um, that you're looking at the artwork, um, but we're going to see what you can do without do with it without all the support reading material. So the labels are not here, just the artwork. And if you want to know more about the artist, if you want to um, learn the titles of the exhibitions or when they were painted, which I hope you will want to do, all of that's already online at the museum website. So this is a stripped down version for our walkthrough. This is the first work. And 
Here's another. And we'll move on. I should also say while you were browsing that if you were in the gallery, these are very large format paintings on the whole. Oops, should give me. The next. And the next. And the next. And I'm going to have to check here. Yes. Another. One more. Oh, two more. And another. Okay, that's a short little walk through to give you a sense of the body of work on exhibit. What we're going to do for the most of our remaining time is to dig into a few of these works, but my emphasis is not so much on um, teaching you about the art as helping you learn uh, independent skills or new skills for looking at art that you can take with you. Um, out into your life or into the next exhibition or looking at a classmate's work, whatever it may be. 
Now, EQE, Exercises for the Quiet Eye, is a suite now of almost 60 different visual exercises. And in an hour, we would normally do four, and in 45 minutes, less than that. So I picked two or three, um, um, to, I picked two to start with, which are kind of classic warm-ups. And then we'll move into a couple that I've chosen that will help us emphasize the qualities of this exhibition, which are to, to kind of confront our sense of ambiguity and to stretch our sense, uh, our tolerance for ambiguity, rather than rush to, under, rush to premature understanding. And the second is to really focus on how works of art can help us to see things that are normally unseen. So let's start with one exercise. And I'm going to be showing you two works. And for those of you well-trained in art history classes, this is not a compare and contrast. If you were in the gallery, I would be sending you out to pick whichever of the works you just saw you wanted to focus on. And I can't do much more in this format than to give you two to choose from. But I'm asking you to take a moment, kind of peruse both, choose what you want to give a few minutes to, and then I'm going to talk you through the exercise. For this, so for this, um, if you either have your cell phone handy with notes or if you can grab a piece of scrap paper and a pencil, um, that will help you. I should have said that at the very beginning. Um, it can be anything. I mean, just the back of a receipt for the purpose of this. Give a moment for that. And then the first thing we're going to do with these two works, let me check and make sure I've got everybody. Yeah. Okay. First thing we're going to do is to pick one of these two works. It's your choice completely. And I'm going to ask you to generate a list of words, in, preferably in the form of a column, a list. Um, words which come to mind as you are looking. I would, if possible, please emphasize adjectives or really quick, quick little descriptive phrases, descriptors, in a column. And let your mind flow and just write them down. Don't decide which ones are supposed to be there and which aren't. And we'll take several minutes to do this. And I'm going to ask you to do two or three things with that list in a few minutes. If the words just keep flowing, let them come. If you have to go to the next receipt, that's great. Um, however, if you begin to stall, I'm going to ask you to push through until you have at least 10. I'm not going to ask you how many you have, and you don't have to read them to anybody else. This is for you. A, a journal, a, a column list of words that come to mind, especially descriptors, as you are looking at your choice. And I'm mostly going to be quiet and give you a couple of support prompts along the way.
you may find that you want to just close your eyes and rest them. And then when you open them, see if anything else starts to happen. Then if you find yourself kind of coming to an end, try to push through if your list is short. And if they're just flowing, let them flow. Just keep writing them down. We'll give it another minute. And then I'll ask you to do a couple more things with this list. Whenever you're ready, just close your eyes for a minute. Just refresh your mind a little bit. And when you open them, I'm going to ask you to read down your list really slowly, in a leisurely way. Pay attention to the words you've written. And I'd like you to circle the three that really seem to say the most about the work or about your reaction to it. Of all the things that are written, all the things that, written, that you've written, the ones that seem most significant or meaningful. And then I'd like you to read down the list again and kind of pay attention to what's inside your own mind as you do. At the point in the list where you, the words seem to become repetitive or you feel, felt kind of stale or you only kept going because I asked you to. At that point in the list, I'd like you to draw a line between the words. It's completely possible that the line is at the very top or at the very bottom, but generally it's somewhere in the middle. Just read down and mark where your energy level changed. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop at those two steps, but I'm going to suggest another one to you in a moment after we talk for a minute about your responses. The absolute ground rules of EQE, which we've had to adapt in a couple of ways. One is that you always get to choose the work you're going to look at. No tour guide, no teacher, no, no curator, no artist decides for you. The other is that you never have to share your responses unless you want to. 
in that spirit, is there anybody who would like to read their list to us? And if no one volunteers, that's cool. Now, the way you volunteer in this format is you just unmute yourself and speak up. I see some of you, but not others. I could do it if you can hear me. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Uh, which you want the whole which list? Did, yeah. Which word did okay. you choose? Uh, the one on the right. Thank you. Okay. Here goes. Green, red, dark, handsome, far, posture, upright, tight, confident, outline, out of place, anonymous, suited, fitted, fit, clean, engaged, proper, fancy, special, official, honor, outside, outdoors, farm, nourish, flowers, flourish, flourishing, nurturing, exceptional, wonderful, growth, and growing. Thank you very much. May I ask you which three words from that? Um, uh, growing, flourishing, and um, handsome. If I remember correctly, that's one from fairly near the top and a couple from near the bottom, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, may I ask, roughly speaking, where your line was in your list? Uh, it was right about in the middle between um, proper and fancy. Okay, so handsome's above and growing and flourishing are below. Yes. Cool, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to read their list? We'll just do one or two and we don't need a second volunteer. I will. Oh, okay, thank you, Jay. Um, just because I picked the opposite picture. Excellent, uh, thank you. I had a duck, pride, protect, pull away, surprise, hold, and scared. Thank you. And the three that you chose? Protect, pull away, and scared. Which is the bottom of the list, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And your, your line, was it by any chance at the bottom? It was at the bottom. Okay. All right. Let me tell you what you're looking at, um, what, you're, what you've done. What you have in front of you is a journal in real time of your reactions to the work. I could say more about why I ask for adjectives more than not, but you can save that for another time. So it's a record of your impressions as they came to you not what you thought you were supposed to write or what you would use for phrases for an essay, but just a record of how you saw things. Generally speaking, and I'm oversimplifying things a great deal, what's a, that line is the point at which your kind of good positive habits of looking petered out for this work this time, where what, you're, what you feel confident doing kind of came to an end you stalled out or you had to push or whatever. And then, and then with a second wind, you went on. And so almost by definition, below that line, you're stretching your looking skills. If all of your most important impressions are above the line, it means you've got a really well-established general set of skills, right? You saw the important things fairly quickly. If you've got a mixture, it means that you saw some really significant things first, but that if you had not pushed through that line, you would have missed the rest. And generally speaking, what is below the line is the synthetic, the kind of interpretive, the complexer reactions. So you would have missed those if where that line is, you'd gotten a little bit frustrated or unsure of yourself and walked away and looked at the next work. I'm also gonna point out that that was 22 times normal looking time. And what in effect I did was trick you into focusing longer than usual. So there's, there's benefit just in doing that. For those of you who are students, especially if you haven't written a lot about art, um, you can use this journal 
as the key words that you would put into either a visual analysis or some kind of an interpretive essay. Make sure you use, you know, all, of, all 10 words or more. Or that you finish your essay or begin, begin your essay with your first impressions and begin it and end it with your most important impressions. So this can be a very useful tool. I wish I could say more. Um, if you're ready, I'd like to go on and do another exercise. Just keep us on track. So I'm looking for some sort of nods or smiles. Okay. Let's try something completely different. Right. In this case, I only picked one work because there was nowhere, there's no way to share the screen. It's a shorter one. And if we were in the gallery, would, we would be sharing with each other, but we'll just use it as a kind of focus exercise. And looking at this particular work from the exhibition, um, I'm going to let you loose in just a second. But I'm going to tell you what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take a good, leisurely, emphasize the word, meandering look. Being aware of when you're let loose, where your eye goes first, where you start, how, what path your eye takes through the work. And if it stall, if it pauses, you find yourself hanging somewhere. Then ask yourself why that happened. What is it about the work or about your looking? And then like a Ouija board, if it keeps moving on, just let it do that until it comes to rest. And again, ask yourself why you think your eye came to rest. There's one proviso to this exercise that I've learned from experience. Um, if you find yourself going around in a circle three times, that's another version of being done. <laughs> if your eye doesn't come to rest, you may want to just pause at that point anyway. So I'm going to be quiet for uh, three or four minutes and just let you do some eye travel, paying attention to the route that your eye takes. See you soon. Now, when your eye has come to a rest, um, don't feel like you have to stare just because everybody's still traveling. Um, 
shake yourself out a little bit. Just wait, wait quietly for a moment. We'll give it another half minute. ask if there's anybody who would like to tell us it's mostly going to be verbal description but tell us kind of the path that your eye took anybody like to we don't need to my dog has just arrived pardon me anybody like to show us or I can talk about what's going on as your eye moves. Maybe I'll do that. Um, a really brilliant man um, who's kind of the guiding light in my pulling together into this my thought about art named Rudolf Arnheim wrote three short pithy direct pages about um, for art teachers about the difference between seeing and looking. And of course, many people can use many different distinctions, but this one I find really useful. Seeing is mostly a matter of what your eyes do. It may be personal in the sense that our optics are different or that our circumstances are different. But looking is seeing plus the guiding operation of thought. So that when you're looking at something, you see the first thing, and then in an effort to understand what you're looking at and what's going on, you explore around it till you find the next thing. And then with those two points, you, do, you go the next step. You're seeing that now and you look around until you understand or find the next guide point for what your eye and what your mind are doing. So looking is seeing thought or seeing thinking. While the majority of human beings allowing for corrected sight and so on see in approximately similar ways. The way we look is absolutely personal because it is guided by the way our own individual mind thinks, what it finds is interesting, what it recognizes or doesn't and so on. So any two people or ten people standing in front of this work might start at the, at the same point, you might, I could explain to you why. I mean, there's a dialogue going on. The artist may give you from starting points. But any two people may start at the same point, but what they look for around that first point will be different, influenced by their minds. And as you get to two or three or four steps, individuals in a group, their looking experience will diverge further and further and further, even to the extent that we know that if there is a good deal of representational content in the work, that some people will simply miss things. Members of families, you know, the coffin in the background, simply miss things because of the seeing thinking pattern their, their path took. So this is a very useful way to get you to see through a whole work. Um, and to be able to discuss with other people how differently they saw it. I think I need to leave it there in order to go ahead to the next. We're going to do one, one more exercise, and then I'm going to recommend one to you to take home. So let me, let me ask, no, I'm actually, I'm going to make a choice for you. Um, we're going to look at two again, and you're going to be choosing one. Just take a moment to... Let your eyes land on one or the other. If you don't have a pencil or a pen or a crayon and a piece of scratch paper, would you just speak up? Because then I'm going to switch exercises. But if everybody does, we're going to do a very, very simple form of sketch. 
anybody to speak up because we can happily switch. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Then what I would like you to do is to draw on your receipt or your back of an envelope um, a frame, approximately the proportions of the work you've chosen, basically a vertical or a horizontal. And into that, I would like you to sketch in, no points for draftsmanship, a few of the major features that you see in the work. It's up to you how many, they're different works. So just a few shapes or a few recognizable objects, a few um, grounding points within your frame. We'll give it just a half minute for this part. There's another step. And the sketch is just for your use. Now, whichever of these that you've chosen, if, you've, if you have a complete and full interpretive understanding of this work and its context, you're done. <laughs> you can just wait for the rest of us. I, I don't believe that's possible, so allow me to smile. What I would like you to do then is to put some arrows, point some arrows into your picture to the points which you would look at more fully, or that you would like to know more about, or that you might research online or get some other information about in order to approach a fuller understanding to the work in the richness of time. So given what you've seen and how your eyes traveled and what you prioritized by putting in the image. Which are the parts that you would choose in order to go more deeply into understanding the work? And if you like, write your questions next to the arrows. And I beg of you that you not restrict yourself to questions you think you can answer. If you find questions you can't answer, that's marvelous. Take another half minute.
One of the reasons that I um, started working on what became EQE is that as a professor in an art college, I began to see more and more clearly that we have been treating art, especially in an educational environment, as if most works of art are puzzles, like jigsaw puzzles, that are waiting to be figured out. And that our job as viewers is to kind of solve the puzzle. And what I'm hoping to do in some of these exercises is to give permission to be aware of not having resolved their understanding yet. That it is just fine to be suspended in a place of uncertain, unresolved discovery. And that's the nature of this exercise, because it gives you, uh, by drawing the drawing and saying you've got things yet to understand, you're affirming that to yourself. And you're giving yourself a path to where you might go to discover more fully. Would anybody, we have, you've already given me a couple of extra minutes and I'm going to take two more, but would anybody like to tell us which work they chose and one thing that they pointed to that they would want to consider more fully? And if so, again, just unmute yourself and speak up. I will if no one else you, wants to chime in. Um, so I chose the one on the left. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to know more about the who who are the hands who are carrying the casket. I have a I have a question. Yes, Kevin. If you don't mind, please. Um, I mean this this exercise made me think of this question, but the the last ones too. Um, that at a certain point, like like if you're um, in this exercise, uh, creating a space where you're willing to acknowledge that you don't know everything, <clears throat> and there are things that you want to know and that you don't know about the work, and um, this is something that we don't usually do when we're looking at art. We're trying to figure it out. At, at a certain point, um, it seems like that becomes partly about the work of art, but it's also partly about me as a viewer. So it becomes a kind of self-inquiry too. So That's is that, is that absolutely true? Absolutely correct. Yeah. I'm watching Sarah smiling and nodding. One of the other basic tenets of EQE is that it, it, we work on building a tolerance for ambiguity and also a, a capacity to develop an I-thou relationship a recognition that the humanity in me is recognizing the humanity embedded in the work. And I don't mean the, the artist that you're imagining, but in the work. And that that actually is about what happens in the space. I don't mean mystically, but intellectually between the work and the viewer. And yes, it's absolutely about developing self inquiry into a full understanding. Thank you. You just gave me my, my conclusion. I would like to leave you with a one minute exercise as a wind down. Our usual wind down exercise is almost impossible so, um, to do virtually. So I'm going to move to one more set and ask you to choose one. Oops, my screen is locked. Hang on. Hang on. There we go. I'd like you to choose one of these two works and simply in your own mind or jot it down. To ask yourself, what would you whisper to the artist if he were present? It is a particular individual living in New Hampshire. And what would you say to him out loud in public? So two phrases or two questions. And we'll wind out with that. And in two minutes, I will say goodbye and thank you. But, but we'll stay and hang around if there are any questions. What would you whisper to the artist if he were present? And what would you say out loud in public if he were there?
Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. For Annie, please um, just unmute yourself and ask, or you can just leave the meeting. But I just wanted to announce she's doing this workshop again next Thursday um, at noontime. Um, if you'd like to join us again, I believe we're going to use the images from Impact um, for next week and maybe a combination of both. Um, so we may, we'll do a couple of the same exercises for skill building and do some new things. May I make my announcement, Sarah? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, this has been a labor of love for about 12 years and began at the Corcoran College of Art and Design. Um, not yesterday. The day before yesterday, I heard from Ragdale Art Colony that I'd been made the Francis Shaw Fellow for 2021 to write EQE up as the book that's been on the back burner for at least a couple of years. I've been promising it to Sarah and others. So I'm going to be able to pull this together. And it's, I thank everybody who has taught me by participating. Thank you, and I'm staying. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice Thank to have you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks so Thank much. Thanks, everybody. Oh, hi, Rosie. Bye-bye. I thought I was waiting to get on. I don't know what happened. But I'll try to get on next week if I can. Very good. Okay. Does anybody have a question? or uh, The juxtaposition of the two paintings. Uh, they were... They are absolutely not meant as comparing pairs. I tried to choose things that were across the seven that I chose from the 12. I tried to choose works that were as yeah. discrepant and representative, representative as the group as possible so that cumulatively each person spent more time looking at quite different works. That's really all that's going on. I'm absolutely in this dynamic, Kevin asked about this, the dynamic between the work and the viewer. There are many brilliant and committed people working on understanding the work. And what I'm working on is enhancing, developing, strengthening the art, the role that the viewer plays as an independent looker. So I'm, I choose things not because they might represent um, Enrico Riley, but because they create opportunities in the mind of the person doing it. The coffin, I just thought of RBG and I thought that was inappropriate to bring it up, but I I did. Let's get that book going. Okay. We'll do. Okay. Yes, Can Kevin. I ask a... Thank you. For sure, Jason. Uh, hi. Hi. That's not like Kevin had another question. Um, yeah. Um, so so um, I'm wondering if you've had the chance to work with artists um, and and have them see people doing these exercises with their work and and if so does does the the experience of um seeing people do these exercises with their work uh influence their future work oh. in other words yeah uh, i i think i can say I, I can extrapolate and say well i can say yes 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 and i think so uh -huh. um this work originally began, well, I'm a museum educator and I've been thinking about ways to change the relationship between the viewer and works of art for years. Um, some of these are very typical museum education techniques. Some of them are cantankerous things I thought up. Some of them were things that my graduate students developed and then we tested. They've done beta testing and outcomes assessment and all of that for most of these. That said, we did this in the context of the Corcoran College of Art and Design and the Corcoran Museum of Art. And the fact that those conjoined institutions gave us an opportunity that almost nowhere else exists of working with contemporary art, contemporary artists, students, and historical art. Um, so um, some of these exercises, one I'll do next week, which is about objectivity and subjectivity, were specifically developed as pre-training for CRIT, um, and especially for seniors, which was really a problem in trying to change the way the dialogue and the looking happened, both in art, uh, art students' own assessment of their work and in their learning to talk to each other in constructive but visually based ways. So yes, um, I've done this, um, I, my life was in Washington until five years ago and have done it at places, um, I'm trying to think, um, gosh, I just left. I'm sorry, my favorite artist collaborative is six blocks from my own. Um, 
oh, that's happening to me now. Um, but I've done this with groups of friends. I've done it at Thursday open nights in public galleries. I've done it um, with two or three artist friends who are, want some real feedback from each other um, in their galleries. So formally, informally, in public, part of Grand Rounds once at the Royal Academy in London. <laughs> I'm Grand, Grand Crits. So yeah, I've had, I, I have certainly been told that people have gone back to their studios and done something sort of differently, or that is teaching artists that have gone back into the classrooms and done something differently. But I only have, I only have their testimony. Great. Thank you. Jason, you had a question. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, I'm a curator and educator at the Middlebury College Museum of Art, and I enjoyed this oh. so much. And unfortunately, I have a call coming in in one minute. I'd love to, to, to tell you how much I enjoyed it, but I'll have to go. I, until the book comes out, which is so exciting, is there a place where I could learn more? Do you have a website? or? Well, I'm rebuilding a website as... Um, I had a catastrophe with my computer. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I really lost 80% of my research. <laughs> Most of it's back. But out of this, one of the dozens of people who offered to help offered to rebuild my website. So I took the old one down because it's too dated. Um, and there's no one going up. I forgot to give you this screen, which has my email address. Oh, great. Store at Brandeis. Um, and you can get in touch with me. There are summary worksheets. Um, there's a sort of one page philosophical summary. There are guidelines on how to teach the stuff. Um, that's, it's all going into the book, but Wonderful. those rough drafts of history exist. Wonderful. This is I'd, I'd love to hear from you. I, I would love to have you know, quite a background in VTS and I've been doing more with Project oh. Zero's uh, mm -hmm. Visible Thinking, but I, I love what we did today and I can't wait to learn more. So terrific. Sorry, I, I was one of, I was one of Filiana Wine's first six beta trainees. For oh, VTS. wow. You probably know Sandy so all of then. Absolutely. Yeah. Sandy, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to be in touch more. <laughs> Let's chat. Thank you so Let's much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Kevin, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. okay, well, thank you. David, uh, Arthur Greenberg, thank you for joining us. <laughs> if, you, if you're asking a question, you need to unmute yourself. I'm not asking a question, and just thank oh, okay. you for the presentation. My, my daughter is okay. a Brandeis graduate um, yeah, many years ago. Oh, terrific. Well, Brandeis brought me here from Washington when the Corcoran uh, was dissolved. Great. Thank you very much. Take care. And David, I see you there. Thank, Thank you. For you. Coming. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much, Annie. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.